If you were driving down the Bishop Ford and you passed Algo Gardens, you might not even know it. There's no sign, no plaque, no monument pointing you there. But what you may have noticed was the smell. So one of those things that I thought was normal was the smell on the expressway. I always knew as a kid where we were in the ride, like even if I had fallen asleep based on the smell in the car. It smelled like almost a fart that just don't go. It's just in the air indefinitely. You know where you are because of that smell. Driving from the South, you knew you were back in Chicago because of the smell. But I could be sleeping in the car as a little guy and like go like, oh, you know, we must be almost home. Welcome to episode two. They should have never built this. The experience comes back to me even now when I drive south on the Bishop Ford. Every now and then, I get the whiff of the putridness of the air, and it brings back childhood memories, actually, that trigger in me summertime when we would just kind of smell a putrid smell, but we didn't know what it was. We thought that that was just a part of our environment. There wasn't anyone saying, yeah, you know, that smell's coming from a landfill. I, I didn't know where it was coming from. I had no, no clue. I didn't think about the smell. It just became, it was normal to have poor air. What I learned about from Hazel, what caused that smell is different industries that surrounded us were pumping out a lot of pollutants and um, using the areas for illegal dumping of different chemicals, carcinogens that lead to like skin disease and things like that. As far as the smell coming, she, she would just point out that it's not right. Probably not having the scientific correct terms to use it in, but she did let us know that it was a problem. Even up to now, you can periodically, especially when it get warm, that's when you really smell it. It's not as bad as it used to be, but it is still present. And this is true for me, too. Growing up, I remember driving after school down the Bishop Ford every day, and it would be almost like a game in the backseat of the car of time to get our windows up, time to hold our nose, and who can hold their breath the longest. And that smell, understanding that this is something that is putrid and not right, but not having a lot of answers, is really my starting point in going deeper into this story. So how do we get here? We're the most obvious marker of an area of our city is a smell that makes your nose burn. Before we get to Hazel's arrival in our story, we gotta go way back. Because to understand her story, we have to understand the land where the story takes place. All this beautiful space out here. Mm-hmm. Won't catch me out here, the coyotes. I'm telling you, we, we got chanted for us at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> There's document that we have beavers in this water too. Mm. It's a warm, beautiful summer day in Chicago, and we're seeing the gardens and the toxic donut overall with a whole new perspective from the water. We're joining the environmental nonprofit Open Lands and a whole bunch of other Chicagoans for a canoe ride on the Little Calumet River, learning both about the rich ecological diversity of the area, but just as importantly, about the role this waterway played in the history of liberation. You're going to put in and you're going to start paddling west. Chicago itself was a really strong haven for freedom seekers along the Underground Railroad. And there were people in Chicago and also along the Little Calumet River right here that would offer assistance. They would offer food. They would offer, um, you know, a place to stay. And they would offer transportation to move uh, freedom seekers usually ultimately to Canada. So right on the banks of the Little Calumet River where you see power lines is where the Tan farm was and the Tans um, housed and helped to transport people. If it's not too windy, the last site you're gonna see is the Indiana Street Bridge. Have you guys all heard of the town of Dalton, which is just right over there? Yeah. <laughs> George Dalton and his son were abolitionists and they started a ferry that moved people across the Little Calumet River where the Indiana Street Bridge is now. Hundreds of freedom seekers crossed the river there. 
even though there was no slavery here, um, at a certain point there was a fugitive slave law that meant that you had to return freedom seekers to the South. Was there any documented enforcement of the Fugitive Slave Act? I think that enforcement did happen because we do have stories. There was someone whose name was Kuiper, who was some kind of officer in this area, but he was also part of the Underground Railroad Network. There's an old book called The Wonder of the Dunes, and it has stories from his descendants. So they were coming up um, looking for people, definitely. So remember, notice the power lines, and that's the where the crossing was. Okay, thank you. And with that, we should probably uh, get ready to paddle. As a lifelong Chicagoan, a lifelong Black Chicagoan, and somebody deeply connected to abolition, I had no idea that there were waterways or really any major passageways connected to the Underground Railroad here in Chicago. So being the nerd that I am, I went to my local library and I tracked down Wonders of the Dunes. Oh yeah? And let me tell you. What a wonder. (laughs) Indeed. (laughs) Before we even get to the Underground Railroad, of course, there's a rich history of people who had lived here for thousands of years. Indigenous people used to live in this land before they even built all their gardens. Some of the sovereign nations that existed in the Calumet region were the Muscoutin, the Miami, the Potawatomi, the Illinois, the Chippewa, and many more. By the early 1800s, as the European settler colonial project reached the Lake Michigan region, the Potawatomi and the Illinois Indians were drawn into conflict as their territories grew smaller and smaller. A huge battle took place on the banks of the Calumet River, at the southeastern foot of Blue Island, near where the electric powerhouse now stands. After that battle, the trail from Riverdale to Blue Island, near the southern bank of the Calumet, was called Bloody Trail by the Potawatomis. After the Treaty of Prairie du Chien in 1829, the U.S. claimed to own all the country on the east side of the Mississippi from the Gulf of Mexico to the mouth of the Wisconsin River. After the Black Hawk War, which is a whole other podcast that we would love to make, but for the interest of time, we won't go as deep, a final treaty was made with the Potawatomis, Chippewas, and Ottawas in 1833. This final treaty legalized the theft of this land and brought it into the U.S. colonial project officially. And as a concession, and let's call it a symbolic concession, the Potawatomi were permitted access to hunt and fish along the waterway, which to me reads as insulting. So we also found some stuff about that Constable Kuiper she mentioned, Mm -hmm. some, some real interesting stuff here. So many of us trace the origins of modern policing to the Fugitive Slave Act and the state sanctioned practice of tracking, chasing, and kidnapping people who had escaped bondage. And so we got a real interesting character here that we feel is not only historically significant, but could be a good lesson for maybe how we need to approach some institutional realities today. So let's, let's talk about Constable Kuiper. Let's get into it. So from what we can tell, Constable Kuiper had a real good reputation and folks would come looking for him when they were looking for their air quote property. And the reason why Kuiper was the man back then is because he would take folks on the most extensive searches. So folks would come up to Illinois, they'd be like, yo, let's get with Kuiper. We know we're going to find him. He would take folks through Indiana, you know, for miles and miles on their wagon and no stone would go unturned. And then folks would be satisfied and exhausted by the search, go on their way and continue looking. And then Kuiper would come home and the very people he was supposedly tracking and helping search for would be stored away in his cellar and he would be feeding them and taking them to their next stop on the Underground Railroad. So before we even get to the freedom-making work of Hazel, this land already has this rich history of liberation and resistance. It also has, in between Kuiper's time and Hazel's time, one of the most massive scale-ups of heavy industry that the world has ever seen. And this is not by accident. As Chicago became a hub of the U.S.'s industrialization, the Calumet region, was assigned that duty and that burden of being where the industrial infrastructure would be developed and housed. The southeast side of Chicago, which is along the Calumet River, is really built for industry. That was Olga Bautista, longtime southeast side resident and environmental justice activist. Bob Ginsburg, another longtime EJ movement participant in the region, agrees. You know, the first steel mill was 18, what, Wisconsin Steel, 1871, at 100 and Fifth and Tarrant, somewhere around there. It wasn't even part of the city of Chicago. It didn't become part of the city of Chicago in 1888. It was rural. There were still farms there in the 1880s. People had animals grazing in Lake Calumet. You had coke ovens at 119 Stoney. 
You had steel mills just west of Altgeld. You had all the trucks. You still had the Ford plant. So you have all this stuff down there, plus the landfills. It would make sense that there's a health impact. You couldn't necessarily prove that was due to the pollution because that's where it always was. And for many people there, remember back in the early 80s, you still had 10, 12,000 people working at US Steel Southworks. Those people are willing to put up with the, you know, the pollution because their jobs depended on whatever that else was. That's where they lived. So as public health expert Dr. Linda Ray Murray describes, this is the environment in the 1940s that the U.S. government and the city of Chicago decides to build the public housing development, All Gale Gardens. Argyle Garden sits in the middle of an industrial area that's over a century old. So again, remember when uh, Hazel first started, we still had steel mills running. They're shut down now for economic reasons. So you not only had active industry actively polluting the air and water and soil, uh, like the steel industry and foundries, etc., but you had the wastes. Here's Juliana Pino of the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization describing the how and why of the construction of Altgeld Gardens, which opened in 1947. I define Altgeld Gardens as a historically Black community that was placed there by the government because they, as the government, were building some of the first public housing in the United States and wanted a place to put Black war veterans. And that's the place that they chose, regardless of what was already around it. The government knew that this land was highly contaminated before they built the first housing on this unit. They knew it, but they decided to do it because it was a greater need. Veterans from World War II returning back to Chicago didn't have a place to live. In later episodes, we'll get to all of the modern pollution of the last 30, 40 years. But there was so much damage already on that land, air, and water before the first shovel ever broke ground to build Elkhill Gardens. Cheryl, Bob Ginsburg, and Deborah Shore who is the director of Region 5 of the EPA, break down some of the OG pollution that was there before the gardens were even constructed. George M. Poorman used to operate his sewage farm in this area. Think about it, wasn't no regulation to whatever the discharges that he was putting in the soil and into the Little Calumet River. The treatment plant was there long before the public housing development was there. The treatment plant was built in the late 1920s because it was remote. When we think about environmental justice, it was really the Chicago Housing Authority that decided a public housing development should be built right across the street from a wastewater treatment plant. And that's where they built public housing for returning Black soldiers, which tells you an awful lot about this country. In learning, how Algale Gardens was built on pollution and contamination, it actually teaches us so much about how the United States was built on racism. This all-Black community didn't end up in this dangerous environment by accident. Throughout this nation's history, we see how so many of our structures and spaces are shaped by the real impulse to subordinate, separate, and dehumanize Black people and other marginalized communities. And so what we see is the same people and institutions responsible for the harm and environmental degradation are also the entities who chose to place a Black community in this space. And so as we take this look at how segregation operates, we learn that it's not just about distance or senses of superiority. It is about serving the needs of institutional power. And we see the harmful impact of these intentional choices as described by Dr. Sylvia Hood Washington. It was still, you know, legal to segregate Black people. So it was built to get African-Americans to support the war industry And to get them away from, you know, integration of predominantly white working class community. And so they were supposed to basically live in that area and work in those industries in that area and go home and be self-contained. I mean, come on, Chicago is considered one of the most racially segregated, if not the most racially segregated community in the United States. And Olga breaks down what this reality really means for the Southeast side. We live in a city that treated one neighborhood one way, another neighborhood another way. You know, in white in Indiana, it's literally poor white people. I mean, I remember Confederate flags still being flown on porches. And in South Chicago, you know, generations of Mexican-American families in Elk Gardens, Black folks. But what do we all have in common? One, 
we're all working class. And two, we're all trying to have a job that's going to be able to keep our families fed, keep a mortgage paid, keep the rent paid, send the kids to college. We all had the same goals in life. We're all being treated differently, but we're all been also led to believe that we were each other's enemy, that we were supposed to be competing with each other. That way of structuring the Calumet region really did benefit the industry, really kept us separate. And I'm just glad that, you know, we've gotten to a place where we're able to recognize those divisions that were created so that we didn't organize together. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I mean, that's such a great point. Yeah, really profound. I think we moved past that of, yes, oppression, segregation, these harmful systems. It's not only the initial harm that is of great impact, but the conditions that they create actually reduce our ability to connect with each other, to organize and resist. And so this is how these cycles are able to perpetuate themselves and continue on. So that's the foundation and the soil that the gardens was built in. But the truth is, for many people, particularly in the mid-20th century, a space like Altgale Gardens was seen as moving up, a, a nice place to be, almost like suburban in its imagination. Joy West and her family moved in a little over a decade after the gardens was built. And she talks about how, in some ways, the gardens was a bit of an ideal place to live. I am told that my mother originally moved to Allgale Gardens in 1960. I'm told that our family that was living in Bronzeville at the time, my grandmother and our family home, which we visited every Sunday, even when we lived in Allgale Gardens, they learned that there was a housing project, a beautiful housing project on the far south side of Chicago that they thought my mom might be able to secure a unit in the area and raise her family there. It was just a good space for us. There was a school nearby. Our family had recently become Catholic. My grandmother lived near Holy Angels, which is now Our Lady of Africa. At the time, it was said to be very safe. I remember hearing that the Black Panthers had just started a, a breakfast program in the gym at Our Lady of the Gardens. There were some social services. And so I think we were rooted in that community. Even though it was a isolated and still is a very isolated community, I don't know that there was any desire to move from that community because we thought we had everything we needed. You know, when you hear people talking about, I didn't know I was poor. I think I've started to sense that I was poor when the bus for Elizabeth Seton High School picked me up in the gardens. And some of the students on the bus would make comments about the small backyards or the um, clothes that were hanging out on the lines or the incinerators. There were little incinerators. And so I think that's when I realized that, you know, this was a poor environment because we had so much love in our home. And then my second recognition of being poor was I had taken a trip to Europe, European quarter in Augustana College, and I had a sociology course. And in that sociology course, our professor talked about public housing and the way the houses were designed, like there were not closet doors or the light fixtures did not have coverings over them. Just some of the scaled back designs in public housing. And I remember sitting in that lecture thinking, oh my God, I grew up in public housing. I had no idea. So when we started this project and really learning about environmental justice at large, we expected to hear people talking about soil and, and air quality mm -hmm. and a bunch of chemicals. And that is also part of this conversation. But what Cheryl and really what Hazel teaches us is that environmental justice is about people and at the center of people's lives is housing, shelter, and where they live. And especially in this case, we're talking about public housing. And not just the physical realities in public housing, but the political realities and the social perceptions that people both in and outside of those communities have about what it means to live in public housing. The stigmas that are associated with all girl is the bias 
perceptions that they had about people that live in public housing. For an example, we government dependent. We don't want to work. That's the biggest myth that I ever heard in my life, that people in public housing don't want to work. Communities like mine have been redlined to not have those equal opportunities. And I can say during this housing crisis we are experiencing today, people in subsidized public housing are the only population in this country that is really paying 30% of their income for housing needs. Many other families and people are paying more than 50% of their income just to have housing. And that ain't right, you know. That's just not right. So the next time you hear that conflation of public housing equals free housing, that almost always is not the reality. All right, back to Cheryl breaking down how this affects folks who live within public housing. Anytime there was a valuable structure in the Black community, our government played a significant role in the destruction of it. And I remember our management company telling my mother that any of her sons over 18 years old can no longer be on the lease. Then it went to any of your children. And that practice is still distinctly is being practiced today that people don't even challenge. Forced removal. And that was the same way to even move in, in public housing in the 60s, is that you had to be a female-headed household. So if you was married, guess what? Your husband couldn't move in public housing. So when you look at the systemic and institutional discrimination in here in Chicago, there's a tendency of a, us of just accepting what they give us and not even knowing your basic tenant rights related issue, for an example, environmental rights that you should have equal environmental protection like any other community in this country or in, if you want to talk about it globally. So when you don't know those things, people are just scared to fight back because they fear of the repercussion that may be negative towards them. But if you understood your rights, that limits your fear. So now that we know a little bit more about Allgill Gardens and the context of the environmental realities there, let's get back to our hero. And so we're going to learn so much about the organizing efforts and all of the fights that Hazel brought to this space. But first, Cheryl's going to tell us a little bit more about her mother's story and where it all started. My mother was born January 25th, 1935, in New Orleans at Cherokee Hospital. And she lived there up to she got 13 years old. My mother comes from a family of five, but she became an orphan at the age of 12. My grandmother contracted tuberculosis from working in one of those industrialized laundry facilities for hospitals. And back then, there was no cure for TB. My uncle got bit by a rat, and he passed away like three or four months old. My auntie was stillborn, and another uncle, he died six months later after my grandmother. They didn't want my mother to get TB. So they had to declare her a bad girl to put her in one of the bad girl Catholic schools. She lived there one year after, and she moved to California. Then when she was 16, she dropped out and went back to New Orleans. When and how did she find her way to Chicago? Well, she was working at one of those large produce companies, and that's where she met my father, John Johnson. She had her first two kids there. And she moved to Chicago in 1956. What brought them to Chicago? Uh, Because my uncles and auntie had relocated from Mississippi to Chicago. I want to go back to your grandmother a little bit. So you named it now that her passing from tuberculosis was directly related to her work environment and an industrial workspace. Was that something your mother knew as a child or did the work later inform that and she recognized it? Do you get No, my mother always knew that she worked at a laundry facility. And that was caused her to have tuberculosis. And when epidemic of TB, you know, 
they didn't think about wearing respirators and stuff like that or protecting their workers. They they had to work and wash those sheets and materials and send it back to the hospital. And also my mother made the connection because where she lived in New Orleans, it wasn't not too far from Cancer Alley, where all the petroleum companies was located in, in New Orleans. So she was able to make that distinction later on in this work to say, wow, she been around environmental problems probably all her life and didn't recognize it. So just quickly, you heard Cheryl mention Cancer Alley. Cancer Alley is an 85-mile stretch between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. About a quarter of all of the country's total petrochemical production as well as several pipelines, oil refineries, and other gas and oil operations, exist in this 85-mile stretch. ProPublica reported in 2021 that in parts of Cancer Alley, the estimated lifetime cancer risk is up to 47 times what the EPA deems acceptable. That's not great. No, not great. Okay, back to the timeline. Hazel's made it to Chicago. How did she end up in Algo Gardens? See, the only reason why you can move in Algo at that particular time you had to come from a family that had veteran status. My uncle had veteran status, and my mom used to come out here in an apartment that that you rented rooms, tenement. That's, she used to live in that. So she used to always come out here, just thought this place was one of the most beautiful places that she ever seen, and that she would love to raise her kids out here. So March 18, 1962, she moved in all that and. My brothers and them was very ecstatic because they never had their own bedroom. And not to be living with another family. Because she said, I was one year old and one week old when she moved in on their house. That's why I know the date so well. I'm not sure if you guys know this, but Paul Gill Gardens was famous when it was created. It was touted at, I mean, like the, 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 the first lady of the United States came in to Illinois So when Hazel and her husband moved in there, they thought they were moving into a model environment. The whole family moved into a unit. Hazel, John, and all the kids, including Cheryl. Many of Cheryl's early memories in the gardens are about her father. My father was a laborer. Uh, Matter of fact, my father built one of the schools out here. So I can remember when I used to be in our annual parade, and my father used to sit on the curb close to the parade route. And when I got in front of him, well, I tried to do my best. <laughs> I tried, hey, daddy, look at me. <laughs> and I also remember when my father, I never told you about this, but I went out and pick a fight with a girl because my daddy never seen me fight. And I went out there and fought the girl and she beat me up. And I went back and said, Daddy, Daddy, did you see me fight? He was like, yeah, baby, I see you get your ass whooped. <laughs> <laughs> I started crying. You were seen. I was, a, I was a daddy's baby, so I started crying. <laughs> mm. Felt all broken up because he told me that, but I was just happy he, he ain't never seen me fight. Ain't that terrible? Because my father died when I was eight. Then she started making a connection that my father, he died of lung cancer, and he was diagnosed March of 1969, and he passed away June 24th, 1969. Then I looked around and seen where so many people were dying of cancer, plus my husband. Well, I was just start talking to our neighbors and finding out that kids as young as two years old, three girls, that really got my mother in this movement, they didn't have one cancer, they had multiple cancer. And each one of them didn't live past the age of five years old. I know she always talked about one was two years old and she was so little she could still fit in a shoebox. My mother just said, there's just too many people in her neighborhood that are suffering with cancer, something wrong. And I was looking around, I'm hearing, this person had cancer, that person had cancer. I want to know why so many people was having cancer. And she did her own personal research, and that's when she discovered that we was living on the land that was once a landfill of industrial chemicals. The government knew, but the people didn't know. No, the people didn't know. She found the PCR 
June of 1979. She started the organization to deal with a lot of infrastructure deterioration that was happening in Algale. Uh, at that particular time, we had a resident council called the Algale Local Advisory Council, and they had failed to really address those critical issues. So she decided to break away from the residential council and form PCR. So she just mentioned the LAC. The local advisory council is made up of residents of the gardens who are elected to be a decision-making body connected to the Chicago Housing Authority. They're going to come up a lot. Just put a pin in that. We'll get back to them. So when Cheryl says that Hazel founded the organization, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that all of a sudden it was like a big, fancy nonprofit with offices downtown overlooking the lake and a big staff and, and all that. What that really meant was that Hazel started asking a series of very important questions. What's causing all these health effects and who's responsible? These are the same questions that she demanded answers to for the rest of her life. She was the salt of the earth. She's an everyday person, not with all these credentials. That's Dr. Sylvia Hood Washington. But she's smart enough to understand that the issues that they were having at Algale Gardens were not the issues that they had in Louisiana on a farm. They came up north knowing already what a clean environment was like. It may have been racist. They may have been running for people trying to lynch them and and rape them and stuff and castrate them. But they had a food source that was good. They had clean air. They didn't have asthma. They didn't have cancer. didn't have any of that stuff. They came up north and all of a sudden, people are all of a sudden getting cancer. But Hazel was smart enough to know there's something wrong with this environment. She went to the library a lot and she also talked to a lot of people who provided her books and research papers. I mean, our living room became her office and she had papers and books. We used to always complain, like, you get all this around the house, mama. Get this out the house. This is an environmental hazard. (laughs) Yeah, so... (laughs) You are cluttering my environment with this research. (laughs) See, our house was cluttered with papers and information that people send to her. So it seems like the work from home situation was not exactly tenable. And for you young people out there, you got to remember, this is this is before internet, home, Wi-Fi, it was no Zooms. Work from home was a different reality in this time. <laughs> also, I love you said young people. Like we were like alive. On the fence. That, on uh, the fence. You know, walking that line. <laughs> so for the young people out there, there's just a bunch of papers lying around her living room that she Xeroxed and photocopied from the library. As wild as that sounds... We also went to the library. Uh, The PCR archives are housed at the Woodson Regional Branch on 95th and Halstead. In the stacks, we found this letter that Hazel wrote in 1986. Dear Mr. Williams. Not you? No, not me, Mr. Williams. This This is a historical Mr. Williams from back in the day. Dear Mr. Williams, we, the people for community recovery, are requesting office space at the address of 916 East 131st Street to carry on our much needed work with our health and environmental project. Since the project requires health and environmental monitoring that has to be done, as well as a lot of research, it is impossible to do that work from our home. Also, the granting foundation requires that we have an office space. Therefore, we hope you will consider our request as soon as possible. Sincerely, Hazel M. Johnson. We don't know exactly what letter she got back, but we do know is that less than a year later, a letter was sent from a lawyer named Leslie Ann Jones to James Thomas, who is a lawyer for the Chicago Housing Authority. The tone has changed a little bit. Dear Mr. Thomas, that's my lawyer voice. (laughs) As you may know, I represent Hazel Johnson and People for Community Recovery. PCR is a community group comprised almost exclusively of community residents, and Johnson is one of PCR's leaders. PCR has been in the forefront of the active citizens' effort to clean up the air, ground, and water pollution which plagues the area. Mayor Washington himself has commended Hazel Johnson and PCR for the crucial fight they are waging. Since October 1986, PCR has been trying to obtain office space at Alco Gardens. Unfortunately, PCR has been met with bureaucratic stonewalling and harassment mostly from the local advisory council, but also from CHA itself. More troubling is that there is some indication that the LAC is against PCR's activities because the LAC receives contributions from Waste Management Incorporated, which, as you may know, 
operates one of the nation's few PCB burners within a good ball throw of Elko Gardens. PCBs are one of the greatest health hazards known to man. And waste management has been a target of PCR's demonstrations and complaints. Of course, it would be decidingly improper for CHA property, funded as it is by federal dollars, to not be leased to community groups on the basis of the content of that group's speech. I ask you to look into this matter and contact me as soon as possible. Thank you, Leslie Ann Jones, attorney at law. Just a few months later, our third and final letter in the series is addressed to Commissioner Artensa Randolph of the Chicago Housing Authority. Dear Miss Randolph, enclosed are the petition signed by the residents of Altgale Gardens for the removal of the Altgale Gardens Local Advisory Council Executive Board members. The residents feel that the LAC are not representing the community as they should. For further information, please contact Hazel Johnson at 468-1645. She said, call me if you got questions. <laughs> hit, hit my line. That phone number is not valid, by the way. <laughs> So things escalated a little quickly. The LAC was not removed in that moment, but Hazel was able to get access to an office in Uptop. Their office isn't in Uptop anymore. That's actually the result of a win, believe it or not. One of the biggest fights that PCR had, which we'll get into in depth next episode. But the PCR office today is back in an apartment in Algal Gardens. It's not the same apartment that Cheryl or any of the other staff people live. But yet again, there's piles of papers in the corner of a bedroom and one bathroom being shared by the staff and a reception desk in the dining room. Whether historically, whether right now for PCR, or for other organizers in environmental justice and other justice-based movements, one of the most valuable things we can do is make and offer space for people to do the work. Just a few blocks from that space was where we put boats in the water at the beginning of this episode. Before we got in the water, Participants circled up to learn more about the area, and Cheryl jumped in. Right in front of my old office in a yard that, you know, where that tree was, what all, right up in there. They had to clean that up from D, 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 E, and D, D, T. Wow. So when you think about chemicals, y'all, you know, uh, there's a comedian that talk about baby kids. You know, oh, yeah. they don't die, they multiply. <laughs> I, I use that analogy for chemicals because they don't <laughs> die. They multiply and they have a half life of maybe 500 years or more. And who the main people that plays in the ground, in, in the yards and everything is our babies. It's just a soup of environmental contaminants in this area that we need to study. So and they didn't know what to do. Doing anything like, you know what I mean? We've been doing it for 40 years trying to get the cleanup, you know. Okay. But, you know, when, when you public housing, when you federal government, it's a bureaucracy that you go through. The authority would deny that it exists. So you always have to prove that something already exists that they already know. They know it was there. They knew they should have never built it. But now it's an open lab. We just need to test it and learn from it because we have to learn from the mistakes we made in the past. So we won't do it again in the future. While I was busy paddling, soaking up the sun, and pointing out herons and egrets to everybody. Oh, there it is. There's the heron. Right, look right ahead. Cutting right across the water. Oh, yep. Oh, there's a great blue heron. Oh, yeah, there's an egret. Damon stayed behind to talk a little more with Cheryl and her friend, Freddie. Oh, so, did, did, did you? Oh, did you? Oh, oh, yeah. That's, that's, what, like, <laughs> that's what come down here. Those are barges. I'm actually but see, I wouldn't be before. kayaking out there or uh, being in a, a canoe in this big boat that carry garbage. That's why it's not fit for no human consumption and recreation, really. Ain't no telling what's in that river's growing. This is 19 miles of water we waste around the guard. Some kind of way. The Army Corps of Engineers is supposed to be dreading and cleaning it up. But That's what I thought. How could you do that when you're standing letting barges come on? And mm-hmm. these okay. barges are still using diesel fuel and all that old stuff. Mm-hmm. They're not using biofuels or nothing like that. This water will never be healthy, so why not produce some energy from it? Yeah. We'll never drink that water. We'll never, you know, that water's going to always be contaminated. So... Speaking Not of the water, was people fishing out that water? Do people eat that fish? Yes. Mm. You see them down there right now, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I did. You can't stop them what historically was a feeder for our community. Mm. But isn't that dangerous? Ain't that but them, water contaminated? Well, you know what? Uh, yeah, but, you know, people think they can cut out the tumors and all that old stuff. I mean, it's a judgment call. That's why you don't see no 
advisories out here to let people know that they're fishing at their own risk. Shouldn't it be? It should be. Yeah. It should be. But, you know, it's so many battles. <laughs> yeah. This is a food source for people. We're in a food yeah. desert. Yeah. And the concern over the quality of the water, the health of the fish, and the health of the people eating the fish is not new. Hazel wrestled with those same contradictions. I have told people some years ago, do not go over to that river and and fish because there's a little of everything is in that water. I don't want to advocate for poison fish. Yeah. But... People been eating that poison fish for a long, 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 long time. So just like I say, I've been living in this community all my life. For me, change and transformation comes from reconciling contradiction. And that's what's happening in this story and in this place. As we learn about All Gale Gardens, it both was idyllic and toxic, a collective safe haven and an isolated community, the coexistence of oppressive disregard, and a commitment to liberation. And sitting there with Cheryl, I was clearly seeing those contradictions play out. As she was naming the damage to the air and to the waterways, we were also experiencing the regeneration and repair. We were seeing birds that haven't been at the Little Calumet River in decades, returning and making new homes. We were seeing vibrant plant growth on the tops of landfills. And we were seeing fish swim around the drainage pipes that run into the river. And I would say most significantly, as we sat there on this warm, beautiful summer day, what was notably absent was the smell. The smell that my grandmother smelled, that my mother and her friends smelled, that was a notable part of my childhood, on this day was not there. And so we're pushed to reconcile the contradictions that people who live in the gardens have to every day. What does it mean to live in a community on stolen and poisoned land? And how do you fight? to make it healthier for you and the people you love, not just to be able to survive a little longer, but to grow towards freedom. The lessons from that freedom making are literally in the air we breathe. And because of Hazel, her community, and her movement, on that day, the air smelled sweet. Help This Garden Grow is presented by Respair Production and Media with Elevate and People for Community Recovery. The show is hosted and created by us, Damon Williams and Daniel Kisslinger. Our co-executive producers are Sylvia Ewing, Ann Evans, and Cheryl Johnson. Our associate producer is Natalie Frazier. Our editor is Rocio Santos. And our consulting producers are Maurice and Judith from Juneteenth Productions. Special thanks to our creative cabinet, Adela Bass, Olga Batista, Tanisha Harris, Juliana Pino, and Kyra Woods. Our artwork is designed by Ariana Eggleston with additional multimedia support from Davon Clark. Help This Garden Grow was recorded in the Malika Ling Studio at the Breathing Room Space, a movement building center stewarded by the Let Us Breathe Collective. You can find out more about the work of Respair Production and Media at respairmedia.com, get in tune with Elevate and elevatenp.org, and support the work of PCR at peopleforcommunityrecovery.org. Much love to the people. Peace.